way to gain independence as a child to have our hair braided. The braids would come up right here, stop, so all the braids would be hanging like this. That was like my favorite style. If you add all of the hours I spent getting my hair braided as a child, it probably sums up to five years of my life. Yes. straight up stealing. That's not yours to take. The first memory of braids would be as a young girl sitting down in between my mother or a family member's legs for them to braid my hair. Or I would get barrettes put all over my head and we called it bubbles. Everything that I was exploring as a child, my hair was always about locking and twisting and raveling hair and tying it up, getting the roots twisted, shampooing the locks. Put your hair in and it looked decent and you could roll around in the grass and still go to church on Sunday, you know? I was just so determined to learn. It would go to this girl that was like the best braider in our town. You know, she she was nice enough to teach me how to braid and I just kept on practicing on my friends and I would take the stuff to school and braid in school and braid after classes and I would stay like braiding the teachers and stuff like that. Your homegirl braided your hair, sometimes they would, you know, add hair for length. During lunchtime, my friends would be taking my braids out and I'd wear like the crinkly hair and rock that all day. I did my first set of individuals on my own head and it took me three days. Three straight days, like I only stopped to eat and use the restroom, that's it. One of my homeboys, you know, he uh, suggested a young lady to do my hair. I go look in the mirror. The two braids, like it was uneven, like this one was a little closer to this way and this one was going a little back. <laughs> I was hurt, man, and you know, the lady had a nerve to say, do I need to fix anything? <laughs> Getting our hair done, also becomes a celebration of who we are and a part of our identity outside of what you actually look like when you leave the salon. <laughs> There's so much that you can do with black hair, whether it's straight or twisted or braided. It's so beautiful and it's so malleable. You might have someone who's doing a fishtail braid, which is just one big braid in the back. You might have someone who's just doing two, as we call them, French braids, right? And then when we think about cornrow style technique, it gets really complex. Cornrowing as we know it is a very African thing, centered more along the parting and the design of where the braid is going, more so than the braid itself. We found a statue from 500 BC, Nigeria, where the hair was cornrowed. And we found this whole world of weaves that were not called that, using all these materials in different societies throughout West Africa. It's almost like your social security number. Meaning, you could look at someone's hairstyle and you could determine where they're from, what their status is in the society, if they're married, if they're single, if they're a widow, if they're a warrior, if they used to be a soldier, the richer someone was in a society, the more fanciful their hair was. And if we look throughout the diaspora, that's been a way in which African women have expressed their own kind of beauty politics. A Senegalese hair braider might have a very different braiding technique than a Nigerian hair braider might have versus a Brazilian hair braider. On slave ships, one of the first things that was done was that someone's hair was shaved. If hair was thought of as like a social security number, I can look at you and say all of these things about you because of your hairstyle, suddenly people have shaved heads. There's no visual way to say you're from this group and you were this person in this society. And then when the enslaved people were here in the US, there had to be a completely new hair culture that was born out of people from all of these different groups who did not have the materials to actually take care of the hair. During slavery, Sunday was the day that was set aside where you could actually do your hair. It was a time where actual grooming rituals were born and also a way to figure out how to care for hair that could last for an entire week of you weren't going to be able to do anything until the next Sunday. The two main hairstyles that came out of that were head rags and also cornrows because someone else can do your hair for an X amount of time on a Sunday and then you're good for the rest of the week. When we think about African-American women during enslavement, the covering of their hair was something that they had to do. Not until 
much later, do we see African American women participating in a beauty culture for the United States? Affirming who they are, whether it be pressing their hair or braiding their hair or locking their hair, there's a cultural kind of aspect where young girls or older women go to a place where they find a sense of community. And they also think about the ways in which they affirm to the world that they love who they are, that they love the color of their skin, that they love the beauty products that they use. And so people like Madam C.J. Walker and others created a way for African-American women to what? Be businesswomen? For some of them to get out of the realms of domestic labor. And so that's the economic part of black women's beauty. If you go all up along the East Coast, you'll see populations of African women from Senegal, from Ivory Coast, from Nigeria. In many cases, it's out of default fault that we have these businesses open because they unfortunately are having difficulty breaking into other areas because a lot of the women might be very well educated in their home countries but when you come here often the opportunities are limited and so this skill is one way to create income. When I moved here, I probably had like $3,000. In like five months, that was done. <laughs> I was so broke. I was like sleeping on the floor on a friend's apartment. So that was the point that I was like, oh my God, I would really have to go back and like I had nothing. And then I just started running into clients that were my old clients from the island and they were like, oh, I know this shop that needs a braider. Dominicans, they show me so much love out here. It was a wrap, like I was flooded every day. Oh, these are true. I mean, if you didn't know, you better ask somebody. <laughs> I kept practicing, like just doing different family members' heads, and by the time I got to like the seventh grade, I was charging $25. <laughs> and you could come to my house on Friday and have your braids done by Saturday. So it still took a day, but it was okay, and it was only $25, so you can't beat that, right? And I would charge like $10. $15 was like a crazy design. And everybody was just coming to my house. I've had clients since I was 11 or 12 because my mother couldn't do my hair. So it was like, do your own hair, go to your aunts. If they're not available, you either look crazy or you figure it out. <laughs> Sunday afternoons, my mom was braiding my hair and it was torture. I didn't enjoy the experience. And I said to her, the polite version, uh, that I didn't like what she did. And she said, if you don't like it, go and do it yourself. I was like, of course I'm going to go and do it myself. So I did. And I'm at my own request and started learning how to lock and twist on the mop heads, uh, on the tassels, the fringing on the carpet. And I learned how to blow dry with a broken hair dryer and a fork. And that's how I started to get the texture and work it through. I did have a lot of times where braids was like the last resort, like the only thing that I had to fall back on. I would have had to have called a client in in order to pay a bill or things of that. So I, I'm so grateful for the talent. It's gotten my family out of a lot of tough, tough, tough situations. The freedom of being able to say, this is my business, this is my culture, and not have to kind of assimilate to American norms. For black women in particular, however we look, we are not going to look like we're white, which is always going to be what the ideal is in pop culture, in the media, in political debates, in political conversations, and everywhere you turn, the ideal is based on something that we do not look like. Historically, we had this whole melting pot idea that people were going to come here and preserve their own cultures and function and be active citizens in the U.S. But part of that was the requirement or the undertone of you're going to assimilate to work in, in, in our particular environment. During the Great Migration, as a lot of black people were leaving the South and moving to northern cities, braided hair on adults was seen as this country, old-fashioned way of styling hair. And the idea is that if you're moving to the city, if you wanted hair that looked cosmopolitan and sophisticated. And for women, that meant straight hair. So there was a moving away of braided hair because you didn't look city-fied. A lot of that has to do with, in our contemporary context, of why we see there being kind of real consequences for African-American women who wear their hair in braids or wear their hair in locks or decide to do any other style that does not conform to a Eurocentric standard of beauty. The first time 
braids or cornrows in particular were seen and popularized by a non-black person was with Bo Derek. In 1979, she was a not very well-known actress who got cast in a movie 10. It's a 10 minute part her husband, who was also her manager, wanted to make sure that it could be used as a springboard for her getting famous. So she was a young, blonde woman coming out of the water with these long, blonde cornrows, and the style took off. So much that if you start looking at magazines from 1979, like Newsweek, they start calling them bow braids. That was suddenly when they started being called beautiful and acceptable. There were also salons setting up just to do bow braids on white women in 1979, charging anywhere from three to $500 and letting the women know that it would probably only last a few days. Because of the texture of white hair compared to the texture of most black people's hair, a black woman getting cornrows, that's her style for way more than three days. And in 1979, it was absolutely not costing a black woman three to $500 to get her hair cornrowed. They were also seen as being really exotic. There's nothing exotic about the hairstyle being worn by scores of other non-exotic American black people. In the 50s, especially by the 60s, there were always currents of black women, particularly on college campuses and on both coast, who cornrowed their hair. And by the late 60s and early 70s, the style had really caught on. It was on television, if you think of Kim Fields on Facts of Life and Janet Jackson on Good Times. They often wore their hair in two braids. For me, it was so important to see someone who looked like me on television. And braids were the things that connected us outside of just being black girls on TV. Brandy and Moesha, Poetic Justice, I remember seeing Patra. Alicia Keys started the backwards braids, which was so cool. Everybody had braids. It was like the thing in hip hop in general, you know what I mean? Even in, in basketball, when Iverson came out with the braids, the Iversons, like everybody wanted the Iversons. Everybody wanted, I wanted the Iversons, your mother wanted the Iversons, everybody wanted the Iversons, you know? What you see is there's this kind of glorification for African-American women's beauty, something that's raving across. But for African-American women who wear cornrows, there are significant consequences for wearing just that style. Soon after Bo Derek popularized cornrows, there was a court case in 1981, a discrimination suit filed by a black woman named Renee Rogers. She had worked for American Airlines and she wore her hair in cornrows. Her legal argument was that her hairstyle was a part of her cultural heritage. The judge ruled against her in federal court because he said she got her hair done soon after the movie 10 came out. And therefore, there was no legal basis for saying it was cultural heritage because she was doing something that essentially was imitating how Bo Derek styled her hair. There are many cases where women went with braids or with um, natural hair. And that wasn't seen as professional because they were expected to socialize and assimilate to white American cultural norms. I came into the restaurant, I had black braids with like this color. And you know, restaurant spec is you have your hair in a ponytail, pull back out of your face, whatever. So I had it all back in like a long, just regular Dutch braid hanging. I saw like the management side out of me like throughout my shift throughout the day. They sat me down and he's like, you know, I want to talk to you about your hair. And I'm like, what about it? I'm thinking it might be a little too, too, too ethnic for the restaurant. Is there a way we can tone it down? Tone it down? Like, how do you want me to tone down my braids? You know, I said, you know what? I'm sorry, but I won't be taking my hair down. You have any other suggestions? He goes, well, I'm gonna have to contact corporate and see how we can handle this because I just don't think it's restaurant spec. Okay. The next day, he told me I didn't have to come in for my shift. It's because there's this general understanding that if you want a black person to appear scary or not like fitting in with quote unquote American values, it's to show us with natural textured hair. The running joke now at that restaurant, since I've opened the Bray Bar, over half of his staff gets their hair braided here, all of the white girls. There are even white girls there in faux locks. People tell me like, oh, I got to get my hair braided, but I got to take it off Monday because it's not corporate, you know, for work. Or the kids got to come Friday because they got a party on Saturday, but they got to take the braids off for school. How do braids affect education or my 
productivity at work. Decades after Bo Derrick was responsible for completely whitewashing the cultural heritage of cornrows, we have the Kardashians today doing the same thing with cornrows and other braided styles. I'm offended. It offended me like tremendously. You're straight up stealing. You give credit where it's due. It's an outrage. Like you're calling these boxer braids. No, these are cornrows. It's not a no trend. They've been killing it, innovating it in Africa for years. Boxer braids, whatever the fuck those are. They're actually really shitty braids too. Anybody that knows anything about braids will tell you that those were bad braids. I know, I've been in braids all my life. I can tell you at least 30 years of it ain't new. I've never known a day, a time without braids. It's the audacity to confidently name something that you did not create, that has existed for years. That's something that's problematic. Correct it, just say like, you know what? We didn't come up with that, but it's cool. Like we like it, but this is not ours. You know, we didn't come up with this. I was so bitter. I was telling people, if you call me to book an appointment for boxer braids, good luck on your appointment. <laughs> you will not get it. It's deeply offensive that people who have made so much money off of taking these parts of black culture and appropriating them would not even get the correct terminology behind them to just describe what they've appropriated. When things are coming into a high fashion realm and they are magically something really cool and people that are upper class can wear them and you know be cool and edgy, it's just kind of like a slap in the face to the people who were told they were ghetto and getting nasty looks when they were wearing it. I do get offended when you see box braids being labeled as XYZ in a fashion that is not in its most authentic self because it's suppressing my culture, which too often gets suppressed. So at least when you are trying to globalize it, come correct. That's all. Because cultural appropriation is more a of an open conversation. I think that people have kind of chilled and a lot of people are trying to really correct themselves. So I think that that's good and it gives me hope for the future. Although you may have, you know, jacked something that you may not have known that much about once you learned that it's tied to a culture and you may have kind of overstepped your bounds a little bit and you want to correct that, then that's fine. You know, everybody makes mistakes. I'm an artist, I'm a hairdresser. I believe any client that walks into my space, I should be able to give them anything that they ask for. So I often will get loads of women with Asian hair or European hair asking for braids. I take that with great pride because they're coming to someone like myself, knowing that I am from a culture that understands braids and have had braids myself. So therefore you, you take the lead and you guide them in the most appropriate way to get the best of the look that they're looking for. I think one of the the greatest things that's happened in the last few years around cornrows and braids is how it's become the style that we're seeing played with by so many black female celebrities. The number of black women that are just so into braids and natural hair right now is so great a number that it kind of outweighs that kind of feeble, trendy, quick gimmick type deal. I love that it's just taken its place to show that it's just another way to express feeling beautiful. Really